Ketamine is this drug that's been around for, what, 54 years. 54 years. And yet, so many people don't know about it. You go to most physicians, they'll say, I don't know about it. You ask most ER doctors, they'll think that you just want to get high or something. You know, it's amazing. 54 years have gone by, and this has been on the market for about 46 years. This is not a new drug. In fact, it's, 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 it's so not a new drug, and its, and its uh, uniqueness is so profound that the World Health Organization has listed it as one of their core medications. Minim that, what, what core medication is, is it's the minimum that you need, the minimum medical requirement that you need to have any type of basic healthcare system. And yet we, we, we don't know much about it as a society or even in the medical world, and its utilization is pretty sparse. It's high, highly lipophilic. Uh, it is racemic. That means there's an S and an R. Uh, onset's very quick. Duration's relatively short. It's metabolized in the liver, and it's, urine, and it's uh, excreted via the kidneys. There's different structures. There's the R structure, the S structure, and the S plus structure. What does that mean to you guys? Not much really, but it does mean something that, uh, for, for us, it means that the S antimer, okay, this particular structure has about three to four times greater affinity for the NMDA receptor. So in a perfect world, we would just use the S antimer. Typically, uh, we have mixtures that contain both. And so that's where getting brand name ketamine versus non-brand name ketamine actually makes a huge difference because a non-brand name typically has mixtures that are less favorable or cheaper or not manufactured as well. And that can really affect our ketamine infusions um, and, and why some patients have some really bad experiences uh, as opposed to others where, you know, brand name and higher, higher quality products were used. The NMDA receptor, we talked about it briefly, but uh, that is the receptor that we found has been implicated uh, one of the main receptors in central sensitization. Ketamine acts as a uh, competitive antagonist for the NMDA receptor. So again, by binding to that receptor, what it's doing, it's freeing that receptor up from the, from the um, constant and, um, and persistent attachment that, it, that it's had, which has caused that wind-up phenomenon. So again, it's like resetting that receptor. This NMDA receptor is present in all CNS uh, nerves, so in the spinal cord and the brain. It's highly permeable to sodium and uh, uh, calcium. It's also permeable to potassium, and magnesium binds to the NMDA receptor. This is why magnesium has been used for central sensitization in CRPS, because it can act as an NMDA antagonist. Um, NMDA signaling is, is very important. You don't want to get rid of NMDA signaling because that is what causes normal gene expression, normal neuroplasticity. So, you know, some, some patients are on ketamine orally or nasally every single day. I don't believe in that, and this is actually one of the reasons why. Because you can actually cause damage, damage to your nerves if NMDA is not normally expressed. You will see nerve degradation if normal NMDA activity does not occur. However, if too much NMDA activity occurs, you'll also see the same pathway. You will see you know, bad things happening. Again, central sensitization, CRPS, fibromyalgia are, are examples of what will happen. So this is what the NMDA receptor looks like. Again, I won't spend too much time on this, but you'll see it's actually a very complex receptor. And there are multiple sub-receptors that, um, that it has. So multiple things can bind to it in different areas, causing a different effect. Okay, I won't get into this too much. Mechanism of action, as you can see on this slide, I won't get into this, but you'll, I just want to point out, look at this, there's, there's a lot of different receptor sites. There's the glue N1, glue, L, uh, glue N2A, N2B, N2C, N2D, NR1, NRA, uh, NR2AD are just some of the sub-receptors that are on the NMDA receptor. This is important because next time, if you ever discuss this molecule of central sensitization with everyone, anyone, to, to understand the complexity of what we're looking at here is, is so important. Um, other subtypes and other places that ketamine can show its expression include things like CFOS, um, which is a gene ex expression site. Okay, so gene expression. So when you're binding to something where you see abnormal gene expression, you want to reverse that. So binding to CFOS, C Jun, Jun D, B, and FOS B will allow you to um, uh, slow down this abnormal gene expression, which is what's occurring, which is why it's so hard to break it with a simple old pill, pill or a simple old injection, because you're, you're that won't stop what is happening here, which is a hyperproliferation of all of these subreceptors. Um, again, 
more mechanisms of action, NMDA receptors, you have uh, CGMP, AMPA, MGLU-R, a lot of different receptors, dopamine, adrenergic, also ketamine also makes you um, more um, uh, sensitive to mu opiate uh, receptors. So what does that mean? That means that uh, ketamine can actually reset some of those mu receptors, getting rid of that opiate-induced hyperalgesia. So that's important. So now you know, we've actually used ketamine infusions for patients who are on excessive amounts of opiates, resetting their perception or their need, their central, uh, the central receptors to opiates, thus literally overnight going down hundreds of milligrams of morphine equivalents because they don't need it anymore. Their brain doesn't need it anymore. Their receptors don't need it. Again, it's like resetting those receptors. And, and how does that happen? It's not voodoo. It's all because of the basic understanding of the mechanisms of action that are occurring. So let's skip over this. This is, again, more mechanisms of action. More mechanisms of action. I'll skip over this uh, just for time. Obviously, I'm more than happy to answer those questions afterwards. Um, more mechanisms of action. What, again, what I want you to get out of this is the mechanisms of action are so large and so profound that it's more than just, oh, I'm just binding to a simple receptor. So this kind of summarizes the mechanism of action. You have multiple channel effects, NMDA, HC1N, um, um, acetylcholine, um, L-type calcium, glutamate, uh, glycine as well, noradrenaline, dopamine, um, et cetera, et cetera. And by, by affecting those receptors by upregulation or downregulation is how we can change central sensitization. You know, the brain's an incredibly complex organ. And not understanding the complexities is, is where I think we fail in the medical world. But understanding the complexities and understanding how you can attack each of those, kind of like you know you see in the military, you don't just send like one airplane, you send multiple airplanes, multiple soldiers, land, air, sea, whatever, to, to gain an advantage on your enemy. And it's the same thing here. If we're going to attack the brain and try to reset it, we want to make sure that we attack all of those pathologic receptors at the same time. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to, to sort of at least win the battle. So what are the effects of ketamine? Uh, actually, pretty interesting. Besides all this other stuff we talked about, ketamine is one of the only sort of pain medications that we have that actually is not an inhibitor of breathing. So that's kind of nice. So it doesn't inhibit breathing. It, it also increases the, uh, it is kind of nice. It's kind of nice. It's kind of nice when people breathe. Um, uh, it increases the cardiac output, so it increases blood pressure, increases our, our heart rate. That's kind of nice because it actually increases perfusion, you know? So we, we actually want more blood flow. It increases perfusion. It doesn't decrease breathing. It does all of those things that we just kind of skimmed over. Um, and it increases cerebral blood flow. That's a major problem that we see sometimes is this just basic lack of blood flow. And we see that with headaches sometimes. You know, headaches is sort of the same thing. You get the basic lack of blood flow and people get really bad headaches. There's also some evidence, actually a lot of evidence, that ketamine perioperatively reduces chronic pain and reduces requirements for opiate medications. Why is that? Because it, again, prevents the progression of hypersensitization, both peripherally and centrally. There are many studies that have been shown to do that. I just listed a few of them here. So we may wonder, gee, why isn't ketamine used more often perioperatively? Well, there's a few reasons we'll talk about at the end, but, but some of them, you know, in, in, in the best terms, it's because of laziness, and the worst terms is because of simple um, ignorance and, um, and, and bad behavior. So again, reduce acute pain, reduce chronic pain, reduce peripheral sensi sensitization, reduce central sensitization, and reduce opiate-induced hyperalgesia when ketamine is used perioperatively because it's working on so many different mechanisms. Ketamine and PTSD. Um, there are many studies to show this. Uh, we have a lot of experience with this as well, with ketamine infusions reversing PTSD. What is PTSD? PTSD is just like anything else. It's a horrible, horrible experience that leads to um, long-term disability. The injury has stopped, but people are still disabled. Why is that? Because the brain has become so sensitized to that experience that it now perceives non-traumatic things as traumatic. That's why a you know, soldier will come back, they'll close the door, and they'll think a bomb's going off, because they become so sensitized to that. But it, but it interferes with all of their basic functions in life. And we've actually seen, personally we've seen this, but also with, um, with uh, studies, we've seen that, that, that the memories won't go away, but that hypersensitivity will go away, so they can become more functional literally right after the infusion.
Literally, they'll come in, freaking out, they'll leave like they were before their injury. Perfectly fine, no anxiety, no PTSD. Um, and why is that? It's because of the ketamine infusions. Ketamine infusions is, is a long duration infusion of a drug called ketamine, which we kind of briefly talked about, where we can reset some of those receptors that cause central sensitization and all those diseases under that. When done properly, and by properly I mean it's not just doing it, it's monitoring the patient, finding what the correct dosing is for that patient in a completely controlled setting. We do it in a surgery center, not in a closet like some other physicians do. Um, and you have to use the right adjuncts. It is essentially an OR case uh, without actual surgery. So you treat it like a uh, regular anesthesiologist would, where you look at the patient for who they are, and you try to assess the patient for what they need. And, and when a ketamine infusion is done properly, you're able to see, and when you get the right dosing and the right sweet spot for that patient, you're able to see a complete resetting of so many different receptors and so many different pathologic processes that the patient's central sensitization goes down as sometimes to zero, and they become literally pre-injury state. So pretty cool stuff. 